All right, so I think we're back with everything set up here. And um, here's the projects. I showed you last time the command injection. And I think I'll just demonstrate the SQL injection. The, then these binary exploits, you're going to do what I just did in lecture. You're going to go through a series of buffer overflows and take over machine in various ways. And I think I'll demonstrate that next time. This time, in the remaining time, I just want to get you started on SQL injection. And SQL injection, students get pretty confused by it. So it really deserves some introduction. So the SQL injection projects are here. And this is, in the last time we did code injection in Bash, where you would inject commands like change mode and echo and stuff. And the Bash is a relatively familiar language. SQL is just another language. And you can inject commands, but they're in this high-level language. And people who have not been in database administrators usually find SQL sort of baffling at first. Um, and so here's what you do in SQL. In SQL, you have a database, which is a structured organization data. It's a bunch of tables that are connected together, and the tables have rows and columns. And that's all you're supposed to be doing is manipulating data in rows and columns. So you're adding records, deleting records, changing the contents of records, and so on. That's what it's designed to do. But you can abuse it to do other things. But the, num the primary thing SQL is for is storing databases like credit cards and addresses. And mostly what you do is steal that stored data. So if you, the way the administrator uses SQL is by typing in commands like this, there are, where you show things and select things. So if you do show databases, here's the panel the administrator would have, which you would not let a customer have, they can show the databases. And it looks like I lost the word show somehow, so let's put it in now. All right, if you show databases, you'll see there are two databases. There's information schema, which is the table automatically created by MySQL, which is used to organize the data. And then the table that contains customer data is widgets. Widgets is the name of the company. That's what actually contains customer data. Information schema contains automatically generated data. So now you can look at the tables, which show tables. And if you do, um, it'll show you the tables in widgets. Widgets is by default the current database. And the only table in widgets, the widgets database, is the employees table. So. I can select star from employees. That will give me all the data in the employees table. And so I get everything, which is ID numbers, names, and social security numbers for all the people, and there's three people in there. So that's what the administrator can do. They can see everything. But you wouldn't want customers doing that, obviously. So um, you can also select numbers. You can select a one. It'll select a literal thing, one. It doesn't come from any database. And the answer is one. So you can do that. It has one record, and the result is one. Um, you can select subs. You can concatenate things together, like peanut and butter. You can immediate words. These are this is like the echo command in Linux. You can concatenate two words together, and now you have peanut butter. So it's just it's not reading anything. It's just not reading anything. anything. Exactly, and you can concatenate other things. Um, so now I could so I could select everything from employees. I could also select the ID from employees. And so if I do that, then I've hit something wrong here. All right. Then I get the ID numbers, one, two, and three. So you can select a particular thing from data. So I could, um, I could, all right. The ID is a number and the name is a text and social security number is a text and so on. So I could do this. I could select concatenation of name ID from employees. And that will combine these two things together. So I get Bill Gates 1, Steve Jobs 2, Leonard Storwell's 3. That's the name and the ID concatenated together. And I could have conditions like this. I could say where um, this one here is where I'm going to select name and ID where ID equals 1. So instead of getting all the names and IDs, I'm going to have a condition where ID equals one. So that gives me just this one entry. All right. And I can have a complicated entry like this. I can have a compound condition. So I'm going to get ID equals one or cat equals dog or two equals two. So the first condition is true for one record, but only not true for the others. The second condition is always false. And the third condition is always true. And if you have something or something or true, it's always true. So this will give me all the data in the database because I have or conditions and the last one is always true. So I get all the data again. And that's what we're going to do later. So that's 
stuff you have here. All right, now if you don't know the names of the tables, you can find it this way. You can select table names from information schema tables. That is the automatically generated database and the table names always that it uses called tables always contains the name of all the tables in the database. So this is where you, when you start out, you need to know the names of the tables, the names of the rows and the names of the columns. The names of the tables, databases and columns are what you need, not rows. And then you can get data out. So to find them, you go to the automatically generated information schema that is always there for MySQL. And now you get all the tables. You can see there's many, many tables created automatically used by the system, all these capital letters for all kinds of internal bookkeeping. And the only one that is not automatically generated is this last one, employees in lowercase. All the rest of those things are used by the internal MySQL software. And you can get all the columns with this one. Column, these are all the column names that it has in information schema columns. And if you do that, you get, again, many, many columns, which are used for internal database things. And at the very bottom are the only columns that were created by the administrator of this particular company, and that's ID, name, and SSN. So now I know there's an ID field, a name field, and an SSN, and there's only one table. So I now can ask for data, like give me people's social security numbers. So here, there's a couple of, of challenges to find things with this. And what I've done is there's different users. So there's separate, each one of these areas delimited by these lines are separate. So here, you reset the server here. And the next one, you can do SQL injection into a name field. This is what you really give users. You don't give them the ability to type a whole select query. Only the administrator gets a field like this. Normal users get a field like this, like a login form or a buy form, where they can put in the name of something. And so if I put in a name like Sam, it executes this query. The, the database pro, pro developer put in all that. And the only part that I control is the part in there. That's what you do. And the idea is that I can't break it. I can only look for people by name. The problem is, if this is poorly written, which it is, then I can inject code. And just like we did with the other languages like uh, uh, Drupal and that other image magic, the trick is to add punctuation marks in your name and the punctuation marks you add will get confused with the punctuation marks the developer put there. So if I put in Tip O'Neill and submit it, it's gonna give me an error in syntax because this apostrophe that I put in is incorrectly matched with that apostrophe the developer put in. So it looks for a name called tip O and then Neil would be a command like or or something. And that's not a valid SQL command. So it crashes when it tries to execute the command Neil. And that means by inserting apostrophe, I can add commands just like those other languages. So here I have the denial of service attack where I've caused it to give an error message and stop working. And I want to turn that into a code execution attack where I can execute commands. So instead of this sloppy thing, where just an apostrophe followed by junk, I have to give it an apostrophe followed by a valid command. So here's one that's commonly done. All right. And this one you have, you have one apostrophe and then a pound sign at the end, which begins a comment. So this one now your name is Sam or one equals one, and this other apostrophe is ignored because it's after a comment mark. So this is now a compound conditional. The name is equal to Sam, which is never true, or one equals one, which is always true, and I get all the names in the database. I didn't get the social security numbers though, because I wasn't able to change the field I was looking for. This was written by the developer, and the developer only selected for names. So if I want the social security number, this attack did not find it. It found more names than I was supposed to get, but I didn't yet manage to get the social security number. If I want to do that, I have to do another select. I want to select SSN instead of select name. And you can do that by adding a union. You can combine two select queries in the same line with union. It will do the first select query and find some results and then do the second one and find results and add them below the first ones. So this is the command that will let me select something that the developer did not intend for me to select. So this one here, select names where name equals Sam, which never happens and there are zero results. And then it does union select one. So there's zero rows with names and then there's a one I put there. 
And this is now totally under my control. So now I have changed the second form into the first form. I can now type in a whole select query of my choice into a field that was only supposed to let me put in the name, as long as I have it in this format. So now I can go back and do something up here like uh, concatenate name and ID from employees. In principle, I could do that. If it was really called name ID and employees, which it might be, then I should be able to put that in here. Let's see what that does. And it does work. So I can now execute a whole command. There are a few constraints though. Here I only have one, care, one field, so I can only have one column. That's why you need concat. I couldn't select name and ID because you can't add two columns of data to a column that starts with only one. With union, you'll get an error. And, you know, there's a few other limitations, but, you know, this is how you can get away with things. So you can find these things. Then you can use SQL Map, which is the professional tool that is fairly complicated to run, but I have some uh, projects you can examine with instructions from the hacking class. And you can run an automated attack and find... Uh, flags. There is an unprotected target that you connect directly, and then there's a target protected by Cloudflare, which blocks some of the attacks, and you have to use the evasion options in SQL map to get there. And then there's a blind SQL, which um, if you want to do the logic, I would jump down here. This is where you have a database that does not return any data from the database. So here, I can put in a name and submit. So I put in a name that is in the database, like Bill Gates. Then, um, I hit the wrong button again. All right, then I submit it and it finds Bill Gates. So it looks good, but what this query did, it selected the name, but it did not print the name on the screen. It looks like it did, but it didn't print a name from the database. All it does is echo what you put in. And you can tell that um, if I go down here to this one, this one will show me, you see, this is not data that came from the database. That's what I put in. It's echoing my query. But it found something. The reason it found something is because this did have a result. So the way this query works is if it finds at least one result, it prints your, it says found. If it doesn't, it gives you no reply. But under no conditions, you see any data from the database. So this is called blind SQL injection. You, you can execute commands on the server, and you can find out whether they succeeded or failed, but that's it. You do not get any data from the database ever. And you can still get all the data out of the database indirectly. So this, I selected name from employees where either name equals X or A equals A. So again, this condition is always true. So the compound condition is always true. So this is always true. Even though there is no person named X, my query is true. So I get a result of found. So you can now ask a single yes or no question and you can tell if it's true or false. So you do it with ones like uh, this one here, there, X or a equals A. If I change that to A equals B and submit, now I have no nothing found. So I this is what I'm doing. This is a conditional. This is false, so I get no answer. If this was true, I would get an answer. So I can now ask a single yes or no question. I can get one bit of information per query. And so if I want to know, for example, the, the database name, I can do this one to see if the length of the database is one. And if it is, then I would find a result. I did not find a result, so the length of the database is not equal to one. Two. Right, I could now try two, three, and four. That would be one way to get there, and that would get me there eventually, but I can get there faster because this is, I'm not restricted to just equality. I can do greater than four. And see if it is greater than four, and it is greater than four. So I can jump up by bigger numbers. Let's see if it's greater than seven. And it is greater than 7, so you can zero in on it that way, but I don't think it's greater than 10. So it's not greater than 10. So you, see, you can get there by asking yes or no questions. And you can even find out the contents of databases by looking for characters like this. You can do um, substring 1, 1 is B, substring 1, 1 is A. So I'm going to use the name so we can see it. So this one here... We'll check to see if that name starts with the letter B. Now, I know the name is Bill Gates. <coughs> so the first letter is B. So the condition here, substring of name 11 one equals B, that is true. So since it is true, I will get a result. But if I was wrong, 
if I looked at that letter being, say, C, then I would get no results. So you can ask about one letter at a time, you can ask it earlier, you can eventually pump out data. And this is where people like to use tools like SQL Map that will automatically do it, because it can take hundreds of queries to pump out the data. But you can do it by hand for small things. And so I have some challenges here where you find some short things, you can track them down. Anyway, that's uh, the SQL injection project, which you should do. It's one type of attack that people get good at. There used to be something called XP Command Shell that would let you have direct DOS commands on a Windows server, and Microsoft turned that off more than a decade ago. That's almost never on anymore. But you can get away with a lot of things with SQL injection. And if you did the 123 class, we had one where you actually inject PHP and get a PHP shell on the server, by uh, writing into a file on there. There's a lot of ways to do it. But anyway, this gives you some practice with SQL injection. And there's a little bit of it required and a whole lot of extra credit if you want it. And then after that, you can start doing these binary exploits. And I think I'll talk about it in more detail next time, but you start doing the stuff we just did in lecture on a variety of things. Yeah? I don't know what quiz you want for ED. What quiz I want for ED? Or EG, okay. What, and what's the question? What is it you want on that quiz one? Right. So here you can, you have command injection. So you can execute an LS. So it does the pings, and then you have an LS, and you can see there's a flag. You have to find what's inside that file. And if you don't know the Unix commands to do that, you can go back to the previous one up here where you practice essential Linux commands. Here's where you learn like a, maybe a dozen common Linux commands. Some of these commands are what you have. So you can execute commands here by just putting them there. And if you do the Linux pro project, you'll see the Linux commands you need and use some of them to find these flags. There's two flags that are easy to find, and there's two that are hard to find. And the commands in the essential Linux are, good, are enough to find them. So that's what you do. And then the same thing basically with image magic. Here you can inject commands in this structure, like echo, hello, and date. So again, you can execute bash commands, and there's a series of flags to hunt for, some easier and some harder to find. So in both cases, there are files on the server that contain flags, and that's what you're looking for. Does that help? Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Where do you have to put a hash signal at the bottom? In the SQL injection? Yeah. The reason I did is because, um, let me get back to it. It seems to be gone. Okay. Let's go here. Um, if I go to the SQL injection, let's go to one that includes that hash like, uh, like this one. Okay. If I do SAM or one equals one, if I don't put the hash in there, look what happens. I've got a syntax error because it says name equals Sam or one equals one. And then there's a apostrophe there without any matching apostrophe. So that's a SQL error and nothing more. And it tells you you've got a problem. So I have to get rid of that apostrophe somehow. And the pound sign is one easy way to get rid of it because it starts a comment. So I put in the pound sign. Now that apostrophe is still there, but the pound tells it to ignore it. That's all. That's why. Now that is one way to do it. This is actually kind of difficult because different languages have different comment symbols. And I've often found this difficult. What's better is to do this. Use text here instead of numbers. A equals A like that. This is more elegant. You write something that is missing an apostrophe, and now the apostrophe, the developer there, will match it. This is more reliable in my experience, but the pound sign is another option. It makes things a little bit shorter, but if you don't write the pound sign, you're going to have to write a name that is hungry for another apostrophe at the end, so it will match. Okay. Any other questions? All right. I don't think I got any coming in on the chat. Let me bring up my chat. Yep. So, all right. I'm going to stop the share. And I'll hang around to help anybody who wants to work on projects, but that's it for the lecture today. All right.